Thank you, Sean. Um, you make me seem so old. <laughs> um, OK, so <clears throat> I'm going to share with you my research um, on transitions into and through education. And I'm going to some of this research actually comes um, from my my last doctorate um, that I did at the University of Dundee um, with the wonder, wonderful Professor Divya Jindal Snape, who is with us online tonight. So um, hi, Divya. Um, I want to just before I start, I just want to thank our colleagues and um, students and former students. Um, there's lots of former students um, online and anybody I've worked with um, in the past, I can see some names um, online and also colleagues that I've worked with in school as well. I really appreciate your, your support. So what I'm going to do I'm going to start by talking a little bit about myself and um, without being, I don't want to the focus to be on me, I want the focus to be on my research. Um, but I'll explain to you why I'm going to do that in a second. I'm then going to talk about one of my studies, which was about the transitions of LGBT students into and through higher education um, that I did at Dundee with Divya. Um, and then I'm going to share some of the research that I've done on LGBTQ teachers. Um, that I did with um, Samuel Stones. So I'm going to start with um, my first um, doctoral supervisor, Professor, the wonderful Professor Pat Sykes um, from the University of Sheffield, who influenced me in so many ways. She, she really got me fired up about narrative research and life stories and biography and autobiography and she argues well Sykes and Goodson, Ivor Goodson and Pat Sykes argue um, that actually we cannot take the researcher out of the research. The researcher is always in the research, the researcher is always there, is always present and we can't pretend that the researcher actually isn't implicated within the research. The researcher is always there so therefore I can't really talk to you then about my research without talking about a bit about my background, my personal experiences and, and how that's kind of drawn me towards the research that I do. So I think really research is not, I would argue research is not value free, um, it's not neutral, it's not objective, we can't claim it to be objective, the researcher is always within there, within the research and, and that's certainly the position I'm taking. So the literature then has emphasised the role of life history and biography um, in giving voice um, and giving voice to individuals who have experienced marginalisation. Life stories expose pain and suffering, but we have to be careful that we're not just telling lots and lots of stories about pain and suffering, although that needs to be acknowledged. We also want to tell stories of resilience and empowerment, um, because actually if we just tell stories of pain and suffering, although they, that is important, um, that only partially re reflects the experiences of people. Um, and actually many of these, many of these marginalised groups and individuals that I've researched with um, have been resilient in, in lots and lots of different ways. And I think it's important to capture um, not just the stories of tragedy, the stories of um, victimisation, that's really important. I think it's also important that we tell those stories of resilience and empowerment. OK, so I wasn't born in 1969, um, a little bit after that. Um, but in 1969, some of you will know about the Stonewall um, riots um, in the United States. So this was the time when um, homosexuality was illegal and actually um, many LGBTQ people were um, criminalised and were arrested and attacked. Um, and actually what then happened in this particular, um, this particular pub um, or bar or tavern was that um, actually there was a raid, there was a police raid and um, basically, the, the LGBT community fought against um, the police and resisted against the police and there was a big uprising and this was then the beginning of really what was then known as the Gay Liberation Movement. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that because 
often we hear about Stonewall, people talk about Stonewall, but they don't actually know what Stonewall is and where that came from. So I think it's important to acknowledge um, that this was going on. And I guess really the time when I was born, um, in the 1970s, I am very old, um, this was the climate. So the climate, the climate was a climate of hostility, the climate of fear, um, and people had to conceal their identities and, and were very worried really about, um, about the consequences of actually people finding out about their sexuality. And then um, in, the, in the early 1980s, we saw, we saw the, all the hysteria about AIDS. Um, and I was probably about nine or 10 when, when this all took off and all the media headlines about, you know, this is the gay disease, the gay plague, um, and all that sort of panic that that stirred up about, about the, the LGBT community. And um, that was a really, really scary time. So live through that. And then I thought, well, let me choose a song that really reflects um, my experiences um, as, a, as a gay teenager. So 1987, how old would I have been? 16. Um, and I chose Erasure because this was, I, I had this on repeat. Okay, so some of you, apologies if you don't know this, but I felt the words like resonated with my experiences. Over and over again, listening to the words, thinking, actually, um, this is me. I'm really, really scared to actually come out and tell my parents. Um, and how will they feel? What will they say? Will they reject me, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I can talk about this now because my parents are sadly no longer here, so I can talk a little bit about what happened. I wouldn't have felt comfortable talking about this um, if they were still here. But also the words of Savage Garden. So I, this is one of my, my favourite songs. Um, it's called Affirmation. Um, so my partner, Stuart, who I hope is online, but I haven't seen him. Um, <laughs> Hopefully he's there. Um, so he know, he knows the. Oh, he's, he's put his hand up. There you go. So he kn he knows that this is my funeral song. So I've already chosen my funeral song. So I just love the words of this song. Um, and one of the lines says, "I believe you can't control or choose your sexuality," and I just love that. So as I was growing up, I was growing up under, under this era of Section 28. So we had the AIDS crisis. Um, we had all the panic and hysteria about that. We had Section 28 and we had Margaret Thatcher. OK, so following that famous speech, she introduced a piece of legislation called Section 28, um, which essentially um, prohibited schools um, from promoting homosexuality um, as a pretended family relationship. And what that actually meant when I was at school is that schools were then too afraid to address sexuality in any way um, because they were scared of actually promoting it. Um, so I was subjected to the most horrendous in the United States, the most horrendous homophobic bullying. Um, Schools didn't address it, my school didn't address it because they were scared that if they addressed it, they would be deemed or accused to be promoting it. Um, and that's because of Section 28. Now, Section 28 um, wasn't repealed until 2003, so it lasted a long time. And actually, its legacy, I think, lives on. Um, so that sort of explains some of the context. But if we fast forward then to 2017, um, again, a Conservative government, um, let's have a look at the, the change. So I think that just illustrates how much um, we've moved on um, in the last how many years from the 1980s. Um, however, we cannot assume that things are perfect, that things that we cannot assume there's no problem. We still need to keep doing this really, really important work because we know, obviously, we know there are still issues with homophobia, biphobia and transphobia, and we still need to do research that actually addresses these issues head on. 
But I, I like these words um, from Oasis. I know, Vicky, you like these words, don't you? You like this song, Vicky. Um, don't look back in anger, because we can, we can often look back at what's happened in the past, and we can think, actually, um, you know, the way, the way people were treated, that wasn't acceptable, that was really, really, um, you know, bad that people were treated like that. However, I think, I think, personally, that we cannot judge we shouldn't be judging um, the actions and the values of people in the past by the values of the present. Because I think society has moved on, we're now much more aware, we're much more educated about these things, um, and therefore I think we could e we could easily look back in, in, in real anger and think, actually, that was terrible, that was terrible, that was terrible, but actually um, what we're then doing is we're judging the actions and the values of people in the past by the values of the present. So I think that's just kind of my perspective. That I think um, let's try to keep moving forward, really. So, yes, so I did experience bullying um, in schools. Um, my parents, um, actually, I didn't have the option of telling them um, I was gay because I was outed by a friend. Um, so basically, um, I told a friend that I was gay and he told his mum. His mum said that, um, you know, basically she thought I was a real risk um, and she then told my parents and what then happened, and I can talk about this now because sadly they're not here, but basically what then happened was that shut down all communication between me and my parents, essentially, because I'm from a working class background, not that, I'm not saying that everybody from working class backgrounds um, is negative, but my parents really could not accept, and we're going to think this was back in the 1980s, they really could not get their head around it, around it. they really could not accept it, they didn't want to talk about it, they brushed it under the carpet, and actually my, um, my, my father never talked about it. Um, so I think that just illustrates the stigma um, and the prejudice that, that, is, that is surrounding sexuality. When I applied for my first teaching post in 1995, um, one, the chair of governors um, basically didn't want me to get the job. So the chair of governors said, um, obviously Jonathan's a homosexual, he's obviously going to be a risk to children. Um, he didn't want to appoint me. And that was actually challenged directly in the interview because at that time people were becoming, to be, people were just a little bit more aware um, but, you know, you, we, we live through these, these situations and we emerge as more resilient people. I had negative encounters with the police when I was younger. So um, the police, um, I had interactions with the police where the police said, what would happen if we told your school um, that you were gay? Now, I could now, I could look back and that, and I could think, well, actually, the police were really um, homophobic, but actually... I don't want to judge. I don't want to judge their actions and what they said to me by the values of the present, because I now know that obviously the police um, are having much more diversity training. It's much more inclusive. Um, things are moving forward. But yeah, so I I encountered negative. I mean, can you believe that I encountered negative interactions with, with the police? You wouldn't believe it, would you, Marlena? <laughs> but I did. And then obviously having to repeatedly disclose my sexuality. This is an issue, isn't it, for, for all sort of queer people when when you meet people and they say, well, who's your partner? Then you've got to kind of out yourself every time um, and you never quite know how someone's going to react. You know, they might be fantastic, they might be really positive, but they might not be positive. And, um, you know, you might get a negative reaction. So therefore, you tend to conceal Lots of lots of queer people tend to conceal their identities because of because of that fear that actually they'll get a negative reaction. We may more about that later. Okay, so this particular project um, that I did with Divya, um, hi Divya, um, at Dundee, I looked at the transition experiences of LGBTQ students moving into and through higher education. Now, what the literature says, and I draw a lot on the work of Eleanor Formby from Sheffield Hallam, because Eleanor's done some fantastic work in this field. Um, but, but essentially, um, what we know is that students tend to be presented with the same 
um, very white curriculum, very male curriculum. A lot of the research they're presented with is research by, by white researchers or by male researchers. And we need to obviously diversify the curriculum. So the curriculum is often pale, male and scale, as those students said in Eleanor's study. What we know is that many um, LGBT students, LGBTQ students choose universities because of a very particular reason. They often think this is going to be a really supportive place. I'm really going to fit in. Often it can be because there's a, a vibrant scene um, that they can access. Um, and they will avoid places that, that they perceive to be repressant um, or intolerant. So actually the scene, the scene size is quite key for students. They want to come somewhere which they feel is really welcoming and where they can have a good social time and where they can meet other people just like them. Um, and universities with large scenes are thought to be more tolerant and supportive. Students often, um, LGBT students, um, particularly trans students, often um, complain about being misnamed or misgendered, um, tutors using the wrong pronouns, etc. So we need to be aware of that. And although universities often speak publicly of their commitment to equality and diversity, including LGBTQ rights. Actually, this doesn't always match the everyday lived experiences of LGBTQ students um, who may experience verbal abuse, physical abuse um, still in some universities. Physical abuse more common in the US than in the UK, um, but verbal abuse still being an issue um, in some UK universities, which is shocking. And we know, of course, that LGBTQ uh, young people are more likely to, well, LGBTQ people are more likely to experience poor mental health. Um, and we need to really pay attention to that, more likely to experience depression, etc. So the constant retelling and reiterating um, of stories which catalogue pain and misery um, and solely portray gay students as victims um, only provides a partial account or a partial understanding of their lived experiences of university. Because yes, they do experience discrimination, harassment, victimisation, but actually many of them have positive experiences in different ways. And I do draw on Mayer's model of minority stress as a conceptual framework and this looks really really complicated um, but what this essentially says is that if you go to the left of the model so there are circumstances in the environment which which everybody um, expose everybody exposes every individual to general stressors um, and those stressors could be to do with finances relationships um, housing etc Everybody experiences general stresses, but what Mayer says is if you're um, a minority, if you're an individual that has a minority status, um, you experience two more levels of stress on top of those general stresses. So Mayer, so minority status could obviously be um, sexual orientation or race or disability, gender. What Mayer says is um, those individuals experience two more levels of stress. One may cause one of those categories distal stressors. So distal stressors are external stressors, right? So they include things like prejudice. So they're coming from outside onto the person. Prejudice, violence, harassment, discrimination, right? But interestingly, Mayer also talks about proximal stressors. And I find this really fascinating. So proximal stressors are internal stressors. And that is when the individual anticipates that something bad will happen. So those stresses actually are building up inside the individual, they're internal. And the individual is then anticipating a negative reaction. If they come out, they'll get a negative reaction. They think they might get a negative reaction. If they go on a bus, they might think that they'll experience homophobia or biphobia or transphobia. So they're, they're always anticipating a negative reaction. So this leads to concealment. 
individuals start to conceal their identities. They start to um, expect that they will be rejected. They start to anticipate rejection. They start to internalize homophobia. They start to believe that they must be a bad person and they start to self-stigmatize. And all of this results in poor mental health. And Mayer says um, that one way of mitigating that poor mental health is that those individuals form collectives and they come together and they, they form collectives and get social support and solidarity. And that turns those negative mental health outcomes into positive mental health outcomes. But the issue there is that places the emphasis on the individual to solve the problem, whereas actually the problems are coming from society and from prejudice. So we can critique the model. Now, one of the other theories, one of the other conceptual frameworks that I looked at was transitions. So obviously, when we think about students coming into higher education, they go through lots of different transitions. They come in, they go through the first year, second year, third year, and those transitions are linear um, and sequential. They take place in a certain order, in a certain sequence. And what we know is that when individuals experience transitions, that can trigger poor mental health. Any transition can trigger poor mental health. Um, now, what I then did was I, I drew on Divya's wonderful model of multiple and multidimensional transitions, because what this model says is that individuals don't just experience those linear transitions those sequential transitions, they're experiencing multiple transitions all at the same time. Okay, so if you imagine like a student being a colour on a Rubik's Cube, they can, they can move in lots of different directions, so they're experiencing lots of different transitions. So when a student comes to university, they're experiencing academic transitions. They've got to learn new ways of new ways of learning, new ways of study, social transitions, they've got to meet new people, geographical transitions, they're moving away from home, um, psychological transitions, right? Professional transitions, because they might be on a professional programme, they might be training to be a, a teacher or a nurse or a social worker, right? Identity transitions, because they might be exploring their identity. So all of these different transitions are actually ongoing and happening at the same time. And what the model shows, Divya, I hope I'm explaining this correctly, what the model shows is that when one person experiences a transition, that, that individual is connected to another colour. So when they move, the person they're connected with also experiences a transition. So when the student goes to university, they experience all these different transitions, but that also results in transitions for their parents because their parents then have to get used to life without them. Okay, so that's why it's called a multidimensional model of transitions. So I use narrative and life history to, to get people's stories. Um, I used interviews, audio diaries and timelines. So I'm just going to introduce you to some of my participants. Not all of them, but I've just selected a few. OK, so this was Brentley. So Brentley, um, on, on his timeline, because they were involved in producing these timelines. So he obviously went to school. He, he basically told me that he came from the roughest council estate um, in Hull. He went to college. He then went to university and it all fell apart for him. And he got involved in the scene and he got involved in drugs and alcohol and he, he all fell apart and he got poor mental health. He then restarted at a different university a year later. He then had a negative experience because I asked them to reflect on things they found interesting and pertinent that they wanted to tell me. He overheard some homophobia in the university gym and, and he was incensed by it and he challenged it. OK, so that idea of courage, we, we don't just tell stories of tragedy, we can, we can tell stories of courage and resilience. And he challenged it and made the university do something about it. Um, and then he reflected on the relationship that he formed. So what I essentially did was I interviewed them in the first year, in the second year and in the third year. OK, so Brentley described his home city as socioeconomically challenged in the north of England. I just told you it was it was an area in Hull. Okay, he said, 
I was the only gay person on my course. I was petrified of coming out because they were so different to me. They wore really expensive clothes and all had posh accents. One day in the student halls, we played a drinking game and I came out um, as a response to one of the questions. People didn't know what to say and it was all embarrassing. So he then says, I'm not the stereotypical um, gay person. I don't go around wearing makeup, sorry, wearing heels, clicking my fingers, wearing makeup. I'm not clockable as a gay person in that you wouldn't automatically assume I'm gay. It started to affect his health. He was going out, getting drunk, and he was hungover, etc. We had to re recognise that these students, it's not just about coming to university and studying academically. They've got lives outside of university and there's other stuff going on which affects their studies. I found a grey hair and that was caused by the scene. <laughs> I, I just love that quote. Um, I had my drink spiked. It's all drama on the scene and people saying this person has been with this person and so on. Um, I could not establish meaningful relationships. The gay scene is like a stale soup. Every ingredient has touched everything. It's all homogenous and everything tastes the same. Um, occasionally you get the odd bit of Cajun spice, new young guys who basically make things better. Anyway, so he was talking about the, tox the toxic kind of nature of the scene um, and how, the, how actually the scene can be really bad for mental and how the scene can be exclusive, not inclusive, right? So, so essentially, you know, in the scene, there are, there are cliques and there are groups and um, some people are in and some people are out. And if you're over the age of 25, then you can forget it and all of this sort of stuff. And if you haven't got a certain body type, then you're excluded. And it's not always the most inclusive place that you think it might be. He said, I have an active brain. I'm always thinking, um, I'm always thinking, I'm doing even better at this university. I'm knocking out 68. <laughs> I'm the course rep. I have potential. Right, so I'll make sense of this in a second. We did some photo elicitation, okay? So you talked about being on the gay scene and taking drugs and fitting into a toxic scene culture. But then he says, being gay is only part of me. I'm also a runner. So I thought this is really interesting. Right, so another participant, Christopher. If you're not hypermasculine or hyperfeminine, you don't have a place on the scene. I went a few times, I didn't feel like I was accepted because I wasn't wearing a crop top or skinny jeans and I didn't have glitter on my face. Right, so people don't care about sexuality at university. I'm now more comfortable expressing myself. People don't see me as gay. Now, Mark was, my thesis, I had to, put under embargo because there's some very, very sensitive data in here that I'm not able to share. Um, but essentially, Mark experienced a sexual assault before coming to university. Mark was a mature student. He was 26 um, before he came to university. So because of that sexual assault, when he was at university, he had to have counselling. And the counselling service said... To him, the University Counseling Service said, we don't deal with males that have experienced sexual assault. So he was like, I won't tell you what he said to me. It's, in, it's all in my thesis, the stuff that he said. It's like really raw. He challenged the university and said, this is not on. This is really, really not on. Um, how can you not recognise male male victims of sexual assault, etc.? And he got the policy changed. So... When we talk about stories, that's what I mean about stories of courage and stories of resilience and stories of agency, where actually these are not just stories of tragedy, they're making a positive difference. But he did say they take a long time to teach you nothing at university. <laughs> they could have sat me down in 10 minutes and taught me how to do X, Y or Z. I feel like I'm being held back. We studied a whole module on health and safety. Um, but he'd actually done health and safety because he'd worked before he'd come to university. So he didn't need to do all of that and spend a whole module doing it. So he was really frustrated with the university because he just felt he was being held back. Okay, that's what he said. 
for him, university was a second chance. Um, he knew what it was like to work in a rubbish job. And he said that he got abused. He was wearing a long pink jumper with the word equality on it. And someone shouted a word. Um, they laughed at him. And he just thought, that's pathetic. And he said, words like that, actually, they're not going to affect me because actually I, I am gay. So if you tell me that I'm gay, that's not going to affect me. That's who I am. So, yeah, you're right, I am gay. I mean, obviously, some of the words are really offensive, but he's, he was, like, just taking ownership of some of, the, some of the language and labels that people were assigning him. Now, Elizabeth was an interesting one because um, two things with Elizabeth. So she didn't see herself as academic. She'd been told that she was an underachiever at school. She went to university and she just excelled academically. And she didn't realise that she, she'd got that in her to do that. But she was training to be a teacher. And in her second year placement as a trainee teacher, overheard two teachers in the staff room making a homophobic comment. And they were talking about two parents that were in a same-sex relationship. And they were laughing and making fun of these two parents. Um, and she was incensed um, at these mentors. Um, making this homophobic comment. And she then went back to the university and she said, you have to do something about mentor training. You have to train your mentors. They have to understand the Equality Act. And actually, she then supported her university to, to do a whole load of work with, with the mentors to actually support them to, do, to understand inclusion. <clears throat> but she said, my LGBT identity doesn't represent my whole identity. It's part of me. Before I came to university, people saw me as a lesbian. But when I came to university, I decided that I could be whoever or whatever I wanted. I pushed back my LGBT identity a little. And although I've developed friendships with other LGBT people, we don't just talk about being LGBT. We have other interests. So she really valued being at the university. She was labelled as underachieving. Um, since coming to university, she was diagnosed with dyslexia. Now she loves learning. She's getting 70s and 80s in her assignments, and she's beginning to see herself as an academic, and she's reinvented herself. So this is about identity work. Now, Andy was, um, Andy was trans um, and uses they, them pronouns. So they were also a trainee teacher. So Andy says, I'll read this out. I met the head teacher, so this was on a placement. I told them I'm gay and transgender. I asked them how I would be supported. The head seemed a little defensive and said, there's no discrimination in the school. I then asked them how they would refer to me with the children. The head replied by saying that I would be known as Mr. X. I explained that Mr. was not my preferred pronoun because I identified as non-binary. The head basically said it would confuse the children to refer to me by any other pronoun and there was nothing he could do about it because all teachers are known as Mr., Mrs. or Miss. I didn't want to come across as confrontational or worse risk failing my placement, so I just went along with it. And I thought, I'd better just keep my head down. However, inside, I was upset. I was angry. I was repeatedly being misgendered by children and staff and felt like my identity as a non-binary person was completely disregarded. I realised I was a guest in the school. I didn't have any power, and I needed to pass the placement. This was the last time I discussed it with the head. I never discussed it with the school-based mentor. Now, what then happened is Andy then went back to the university and again said, we need some equality training for mentors. They need to understand how to support non-binary staff um, in school and non-binary trainee teachers. Okay, so Andy said, people shouted for me by saying, you're going to get AIDS. Um, sorry, people shouted abuse by saying, you're going to get AIDS or you are vermin. One, someone said, you should be exterminated. Terrible. Andy then needed a lot of mental health support in university to get over some of these problems. So what I then did with my data was I went back to Maya's model. Maya said, 
in that original model the um, minority um, identities they, the way that they mitigate stress is they actually form collectives um, and they group together and they form these groups. Now, in the middle, I through my data, I identified that they actually mitigate stress in a lot of different ways, not just by forming groups. So, yes, they form groups, but also they reach out to friends and family. The Equality Act, knowing that they were protect protected by the law, was also um, a real source of comfort for them. Okay. But also owning the labels was, was something else that they did. There were lots of different um, strategies they used to mitigate stress. So what I'm modeling here is sometimes we can just make a small adaptation to a model. Um, and that's the original contribution to knowledge. OK, so Brentley said, Am I happy being gay? No. Do I accept that I'm gay? Yes. Being gay is part of my identity, but I'm also a runner, a brother. I write Mandarin. I can't be bothered with all the drama that comes with being gay. Right. Christopher says, I don't have a gay identity. Right. So what I did when I analysed my data was I drew on Edmund Coleman's Fountain's work on the post-queer paradigm. So Coleman Fountain um, interviewed some young people and um, he discusses how young LGBT individuals situate themselves within what is called a post-queer, or sometimes it's called a post-gay paradigm in the literature, um, which means that they resist being defined by their sexuality or their gender identity, and they see their sexuality as a component of their identity, but not the whole of their identity. So it's it's just an aspect, but it's not everything. And I, I could relate this to a lot of my participants. So they chose to embrace the narrative of, of emancipation in which sexuality and gender identity are not the prime aspect <coughs> of a person's identity because with um, they didn't want to get locked into those labels, into those negative labels. Um, and they didn't they wanted to claim an identity as an ordinary person. <laughs> That's Coleman Fountain's um, work, this idea that sexuality doesn't have to be the be-all and end-all, it's a component of who you are, but actually you might be an academic, you might be a runner, you might be a brother, you might be a sister, you know, you might be a partner, you've got other identities, you've got those multiple identities. They refuse to be positioned um, within a hierarchy of sexuality and gender, um, which is embedded with assumptions and stereotypes. So they refuse to be pinned down by those labels. They refuse to be associated with stigmatization and negative stereotypes. Most participants in my study, they didn't reject the labels. They, you know, they, they accepted that they were gay or lesbian or um, trans. They didn't reject them, but the labels were not the whole of who they were. That they were just a component. They didn't use the label to describe uh, the label wasn't a prime aspect of their identity. So what I then recommended from my data was a whole institutional approach to LGBTQ inclusion. I was able to synthesize my data and essentially come up with a model or a framework um, that supports a whole institutional approach to LGBTQ inclusion. OK, which puts leadership and management right at the top, right in the centre of that model. Um, so it's got to be a really key strategic priority. But can I just say that my participants said putting a, a rainbow flag on the campus is just tokenistic. It has to be embedded in the curriculum. And they said to me, we have to see our identities in the curriculum. We have to be visible in that curriculum. Models of partnership with students are so working in partnership with students so that students be can become real agents of change. OK, thinking about placements and how we can train mentors and work with mentors. Really, really key. Thinking about the campus environment, the physical environment, but also the emotional environment. Is there a sense of belonging? Do they feel that sense of belonging? Thinking about training for accommodation, accommodation teams, staff who work in accommodation, because that's where lots of 
um, queer students will experience discrimination within accommodation. So training for accommodation teams, thinking about marketing, thinking about open days, all of that. We need to think about the whole of that, the whole institutional approach. And I was able to map kind of all of my data onto that model, really, to create a really, well, I think it's a really useful, useful model. Okay, so, Sean, how long have I got? Okay, so the research that I did on LGBTQ teachers um, says that LGBTQ teachers, queer teachers, are required to negotiate their personal and professional identities. So in other words, okay, so the literature says that if you are LGBTQ as a teacher, you are a teacher, um, you either separate your personal identity from your professional identity and keep it completely separate, okay? So you split the two, personal, professional, okay? Or you intertwine them and you use your personal identity within your professional work to advance equality and social justice and inclusion within your professional work. Now, so the literature describes um, queer teachers as knitters, quitters or splitters. So knitters, they knit the two identities together. Um, splitters, they separate the identities. Quitters, well, they've experienced so much discrimination that they just leave the profession completely. But also what we know from the literature is they they adopt these techniques of passing and covering. So they will pass off as being straight or they'll cover up their um, sexuality by making up a relationship, by making up a heterosexual. I had to, when I was a young teacher, I had to pretend that I'd got a girlfriend. Um, my head teacher knew that I was gay, but he <coughs> pretended, he pretended that I'd got a girlfriend because what he was actually saying to me is, don't you dare come out and say who you are. So we'll just pretend you've got a girlfriend. That was my head teacher. Um, and I've got my wonderful colleague, Jane Stoko, um, who I used to work with in Barnsley there. So um, yeah, interesting times. So Jack said, Jack was a head teacher. So I interviewed um, some LGBTQ teachers. Jack said, the repeal of Section 28 has changed things, but because it was repealed in 2003. It's a delayed reaction. Things didn't change in 2003, it took longer, and it wasn't really until the Equality Act that we started to see that change, and also changes to the Ofsted framework. Right, this was shocking, so he said, so Jack was a head teacher, he said when he started teaching in 1996, the culture was very different. His first school was in Leeds, but he lived in Manchester. He wanted to keep his personal and professional identities separate, so he made a conscious decision to look for jobs away from, well away from his home, jobs on the other side of the Pennine so that he could keep his personal away from his professional. But this was the shocking story. Early in my career as a head, we used a local authority pool system for teachers to apply for jobs. Teachers applied to the pool and could be recruited to work in any school in the local authority. The local authority did the shortlisting and then the heads looked at the application forms for those who'd been shortlisted and offered interviews in their schools. I remember in 2005 going down to the teacher centre and I took a batch of shortlisted application forms. We needed a newly qualified teacher and I was desperate to appoint someone into the role. I pulled out one application form and was puzzled as to why someone had drawn a big star with a circle on the application. He questioned what this meant and said, what do these annotations mean? The local authority officer replied, the candidate was worthy of being interviewed, but as a shortlisting panel, we felt it necessary to draw attention to the fact that the candidate was obviously gay. This was in 2005. In a heartbeat, memories and feelings came flooding back. It was 2005 and the local authority officers were endorsing homophobia. Section 28 had been repealed, but the legacy still cast a shadow. I was appalled and scared. He thought, I'm gay, so I need to be careful. Because he was also gay, so he thought, I need to be careful. 
And then he went as a head teacher, slowly, slowly, slowly started to do lots of great work in, in his school to advance LGBTQ inclusion. And he said, we're building a, snow, a snowball. Every generation is becoming more and more accepting than the previous generation. And it's slowly, slowly, slowly we're changing society. And that's why we have to continue this work. William said, I love this quote, I got my job in, tw in 2011, a small group of evangelical Christians said to the head, we think you have just appointed a gay and we are not happy about it. So they ran to the head teacher and they said, you've just appointed someone who's gay. The head was horrified. I decided I wasn't going to edit out myself, partly because heterosexual staff don't edit their lives, and also partly because I wanted to watch the fear behind their eyes. He thought, I'm not going to edit my life out. You've got the problem, not me. Oliver said, I was appointed in an interim head role in 2015. The executive head said, I noticed on the form that you are gay. Don't go flaunting it around. I mean, this is like really recent, isn't it? It's shocking. Um, and then he says, I know that my students suspect and have said things behind my back. Some staff in the school see LGBTQ as taboo and are not happy to teach it. OK, so we need to think then about what are the implications for partnerships, for mentor training. Um, and also in the work that we in the work that I do and that we do, what are the implications for trainee teachers going into schools and, and doing projects? around race, sexual orientation, um, gender, social class, so what are the, how can we get trainees going into school doing projects around social justice and inclusion? The problem is the CCF, the core concept framework, doesn't address any of that. But we think it's really important, I think it's really important. And then obviously we've got students and trainee teachers with minority identities, so how do we then foster a sense of belonging for them and how can we develop students as agents of change and I just want to say thank you to everyone and I particularly um, want to thank I mean I want to thank all of my colleagues and all of my former students and current students um, and former former colleagues and current colleagues as well but also um, so Divya Jindal Snape um, on the left my wonderful um, doctoral supervisor, um, Mark Vickers, so Dr. Mark Vickers, um, who is in Melbourne, in Australia, is actually here tonight. Um, I don't know what time it is there, Mark, but Mark's work has really, really inspired me for years and years, and I cannot believe that I'm now working with him and researching with him. He is just inspirational, and he's done some amazing work, and my very, very first doctoral supervisor, Professor Pat Sykes from the University of Sheffield, who got me so interested in narrative and life history research and biography. Um, all of these people I am completely um, indebted to. I also want to thank um, my partner, Stuart, for putting up with me. I know I'm not the easiest person um, to live with. And also, um, I want to thank um, also my very, very long-standing um, friend and colleague, Jane Stoko, who is also here. Um, Jane is wonderful and has, I used to teach with her in Barnsley, and we've also written together, um, and I see her every week, um, and she's fabulous. So thank you to everybody. Okay. Congratulations, Jonathan. Join me in a round of applause, please. Thank you.